yourself. Yes, hi. My name is Susan Hayter. I work at the International Labour Organization as a senior advisor on the future of work. The International uh, Labour Organization, for those of you who don't know, is a UN specialized agency dealing with uh, labour, labour standards, labour conditions. Right, so a lot of people in this room probably didn't have a chance to read the paper that your uh, uh, director general has written, Guy Ryder. So maybe you can just tell them why is it that they should read it. Um, so I, let me give you three reasons I think that this um, article is interesting and perhaps different to what you would generally read were you to pick up something on the fourth industrial revolution. The first um, reason is that most of the discussions and conversations around the fourth industrial revolution and, and labor, its impact on labor, have focused on technology. Um, the starting point for this article is not technology but people. The value um, that work has for individuals and its, its role in society. And so I think if we think about the role of work both in, in our immediate survival, putting you know, bread, bread on the table, um, meeting our material needs, but beyond um, that role, the role, work has always had a purposeful, it's always been about purposeful human activity. I mean, we, we've always worked, whether paid or unpaid, and the article gets, gets into that. Um, work also connects us to other individuals and to society. And so I think if we don't, in these discussions, um, look at uh, those, look at the, the value of work for individuals in society, I think we miss a big part of the picture in terms of the stability of our, of our economies and societies. I think the second um, thing that you will find in this article, which is quite interesting, is rather than unpacking um, the way in which technology is, is, you know, how many jobs are going to be lost, um, um, how many jobs are going to be created, how is the content of work changing. Rather than looking at um, the impact on labor from that point of view, this article looks at the impact of digital technologies on the what we call the temporal and spatial dimensions of work. So what matters for us all individually, most importantly, is where we go to work and our working time, how long we work, where and how we work. And, and the fourth industrial revolution has had a, an incredible um, impact on both of those dimensions, which in turn has the possibility to impact on us as individuals and, and on society. Let me just give you two examples. Um, first, the temporal dimension. Um, you know, new technologies offer us um, very new possibilities to balance um, work and our private lives in very different ways. Um, what we call time sovereignty, but they also blur the lines between when we're at work and when we're at home, you know, possibly extending working hours. And, and so the, the article looks at some of that. In terms of the spatial dimensions, um, work has traditionally always taken place in a workplace. We've come together as a unit. From the fissuring of workplaces, which uh, scholars here have written about, to, I think, you know, the remote virtual um, platform, organizing work through platforms, um, we, we have the potential to go back to some of the 19th century labor practices and really create future generations of, of digital day laborers. The third reason that I think you should read the article is um, that whereas it starts with people and the value of work for individuals and society, it ends with what researchers love, the metrics. How do we measure work and well-being? Um, is GDP an adequate measure of, of, of well-being, of the contribution of work um, to society? And it'll be no surprise here that, the, that uh, the article concludes that we really need to take the blinders off GDP and measure better the, the value of both paid work but also unpaid work, unpaid care work that sustains um, our economies um, and, and the contribution to GDP, as well as um, being able to measure some of the, the, um, the impacts um, of, of inequality. Okay, so what, what came to me from reading this very interesting paper is actually that we in, indeed we need to learn how we value paid and unpaid work. 
But in the Western world, we're always concentrating on the housework. And that's why nobody actually is interested in that, yes? But I have been in Rwanda in Kigali last year, and the place is absolutely spotlessly clean. And it turns out that one Saturday a month, everybody is uh, supposed to go into the neighborhood and clean it up and make it nice and pretty. And that is a, a contract, a unspoken contract between the, pe the citizens and the state. And I thought, and, and the thing is that it's the place is clean not because they clean it up. The place is clean because they don't dirty it, yes? Because that's a kind of a behavioral change. And I feel we need to value that kind of a work, to kind of encourage a, a new kind of a social contract between the state and society. So I just wonder, you know, we know about gender budgeting that allows uh, policymakers to learn what, how much they can gain from uh, gender uh, uh, quality policies. So do you think that would be possible to kind of think in a new way about this kind of a social contract? Well, um, just to, last two weeks ago, the ILO Global Commission on the Future of Work released a report um, on the future of work. And that report, interestingly, calls for a reinvigoration of the social contract. The contract basically that um, provides certain guarantees um, to, to working people in exchange for their contribution to the economy. In order to reinvigorate that, that uh, social contract, it calls for a human-centered agenda that puts people and the work they do at the center of economic policy and business practice. Now, um, it does that um, through three pillars, um, investing in people, investing in labor institutions, and investing in transformations in our economy. But I think what's interesting about what you say is that the commission very much was looking at measures of unpaid work. How do we see work? How do we value the role of care work in our societies, the contribution of that to trans you know, transformative uh, gender equality? Um, and very much the, the commission looked at the different measures that were around and proposed actually the development of a supplementary measure to GDP, something that will measure um, informal work, um, unpaid uh, work, um, and, and some of, I think, the distributional aspects um, of GDP um, and, and equality. Um, and I think that there is work for researchers to begin to develop um, those metrics, perhaps uh, an, in, an index of, of, of work and well-being or something like that um, that we could look to in the future. Right, because I think we all do unpaid work, a lot of unpaid work. And if you work with gender, you do a lot of unpaid work. But, you know, uh, the, re the researchers here uh, who do peer review, that's unpaid work, and yet it is not really valued, yes? Uh, people who deliver gender equality plans in universities, they do it, they not, that work is not valued, they just do it. So I think this thing about valuing work, are they going beyond the housework? Of course, that's another thing. But I mean, I can pay someone to do my housework, yes? I'm giving employment to someone else because I can do other things, even though they might not be paid. So I think this is a very important thing that the paper has said. It would really so the value has to be in the benefit to society, yes? So how we measure that, <laughs> and what ILO can do for in this? I think just one thing I'd, I'd like to add on that, and, and what the ILO can do. The ILO hosts the Secretariat for the International Conference of Labor Statisticians. And in 2013, this, this issue was on the agenda, and they adopted a resolution which broadens um, the concept of work and the measurement of work beyond um, simply paid, unpaid, it, it measures informal work in a different way. Um, and, and, and that resolution, I think there's a lot of work to be done to make sure that that resolution translates itself into statistical conventions or um, labor statistics. Um, and there's work for the ILO and for, for, for you to do um, in terms of making sure that uh, time use surveys um, are are extended, are um, conducted, are made comparable. 
Um, the time use surveys that we have to date uh, tells us that uh, three quarters of the work of the unpaid care work that is done is done by women. I think when we begin to measure that and count it um, in, our, in our measures of economic progress, we'll begin to value it and, and, and take pub make public policies uh, that support it. Excellent. Thank you very much. Here is Zachary, your next special issue.